Welcome back into our class, Pastoral Pastoral uh, uh, Studies, okay? This is PS300 Pastoral Studies, okay? And it's called, it's called pa Pastoral Ministry and the Ministerial Defense. Pastoral Ministry and the Ministerial Defense. The issue that we're dealing with here in this particular course, you know, trials, tribulations, afflictions, difficulties, attacks on your person, attacks on your on your character, attacks on your, your integrity, and many times it comes from within inside the church itself. How do you resolve these conflicts? How do you deal with these issues, whether you're a pastor or you're not a pastor? The same principles that I'm going to be teaching through in this class, okay, in this entire series, are the same principle that every single believer is going to have to learn to apply. There is a profound difference between re reacting to a situation and responding to a situation. And the Apostle Paul has much to say to us about this. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's go back into 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to draw your attention to this because it is important that you understand the principles how we deal with conflict. And now in verses 1 through 11, let's go back. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort in salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is, a, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. So, for we do not know, want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will and will deliver us, he whom he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So also joining in helping us through, you also joining us in helping us through your prayers, so that the thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of of many. The Apostle Paul is extremely transparent in all the trials and tribulations and the difficulties that he was facing. And he teaches us through his life experience. You know, that we're not talking about a theoretical issue. We're not talking about uh, uh, some uh, uh, obscure academic theological principle. We're talking about theology applied. Theology applied applied, the Word of God applied exactly on how we're going to resolve these issues when they come into our lives. They don't come in, okay, once in a while. For most people, they're going to have to face all kinds of trials and tribulations in their lives consistently. The issue is not if you're going to face them, but when you face them. Now, most people, if they're honest, just don't not know, they don't understand, they don't know the strength of their faith until it is actually tested. The testing reveals if there are weaknesses or doubts in their faith. And when the doubts and when the despair and when the discouragement and the distress are faced with faith and a confident resolve to rely, to rely on the Lord, then God honors that faith and strengthens the believer to face the next test when it comes his way. And trust me, you and I will face the next test. That is why the scripture challenges, that, that's why the const, that there's this constant, constant challenge in the scripture is to trust the Lord, especially in times of difficulty. Let me draw your attention. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. And in Proverbs chapter 3, we see this in verse 5. It's a well-known verse. We quote it, and yet we violate it all the time. 
In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In the book of Psalms, we're told this. In Psalm chapter 37, verse 3. Psalm chapter 37, verse 3 says this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Trust in the Lord and do good. Especially when you're facing trials and tribulations, attacks on your person, attacks on your character, attacks on your integrity. He says, trust in the Lord and, trust in the Lord and do good. Psalm 115, here's what the, what the psalmist says. In 115 verse 11, Psalm 115 verse 11 says, You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He says, He is their help and their shield. In Psalm 118 verse 8, Psalm 118 verse 8, he says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. You know, one of our natural inclinations, when we feel that we're under attack, we begin to recruit allies. That's, that's what we do. That's what we naturally do. Trust in him, in him alone. God's power comforted the apostle Paul and delivered him from the hour of his death until it was God's time for him to come home to glory. Paul had the confidence that the Lord could deliver him at any time. Paul spoke of God's deliverance in three tenses in verse 10. In three tenses in verse 10 is how God speaks of his deliverance. Okay? Of how Paul speaks of God's deliverance. Look at let me let me draw your attention. Turn your Bibles, go, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Look at this. 2 Corinthians verse 10, he says, Who delivered now? I want you to under, underscore these words. Who delivered us, underscore delivered us, from, he said, delivered from so great a peril of death, and will deliver, underscore will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us, underscore yet will deliver us. Do you see that? Hmm? Yeah, and I want you to see this. There are three tenses here, and it's really crucial to you understand this. Look at them. Who delivered us, underscore that, from so great a peril of death, and will deliver, underscore that, us, he on whom we set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Look at this. Past tense, delivered us. Present tense, will deliver us. Future tense, yet will deliver us. Do you see that? Do you do you see that? You, you, your problem is that you know you know the problem that we face. We just read the Bible too fast. We think the Bible is some kind of a newspaper that we can just read the article today and discard it to, and discard it and buy another one tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. You need to chew the cud. You need to really you really need to meditate on what God is actually saying to us. Do you realize that when Paul? When Paul writes this letter, he knows that the same God who delivered him in the past is able to deliver him day by day and will continue to deliver him until that final grand moment when he will be completely released from all the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions of this world and he goes home to glory. His time is in God's hand and so is yours. Stop. Stop worrying. Stop worrying, okay, about what might happen to you. Just live. Live the moment in the person of Jesus Christ. Live your life for Christ. God allows the bad things in your life to get you to trust in him all the time. So the question then becomes, why do bad things happen to God? Why do bad things happen to God's people? That's the question, right? It's the one that bounces back here in the back of our thoughts all the time. You know, why? You know, we have the audacity to ask that question. Why, God, does bad things happen to people? 
to God's people. And you don't ask the question, why do, bad, why do good people do bad things to God? Hmm? Why do bad things happen to God's people? Paul has given us several answers so far. Number one, to show that our perils are not an obstacle to God's care for us. Number two, to prepare us for ministry and to comfort others. Number three, to get us to place our trust in God when we are under pressure. And number four, fourthly, to promote prayer in the life of believers. These are principles by which we have to find a way to incorporate them into our lives. So we get to number four, which is to promote prayer in the life of believers. Let, let me go back. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. We're walking through this. We're walking through this verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and sometimes word by word, so that we can so that we can get into the details of the word of God and that we will be at a better reflection of who Jesus Christ is while you and I are on this earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, he says, You also joining and helping us through your prayers so that the thanks may be given in many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many, to promote prayer in the life of believers. You know, when everything is hunky-dory, when everything is just fine, it is just, a, it is just a pie in the sky, and we're doing good, we're doing wonderful, we got money in our pocket, right? Okay? We got health, okay? there's no trials and tribulations at home, we're at peace. You better get ready, because it is the quiet before the storm. And I want you to understand that God also allows bad things in the lives of God's people. Why? To move his people to pray for themselves and to pray for one another. Paul understood the importance of prayer. So did James. If he was to wage spiritual warfare and to attain victory, he was going to have to go to he was going to have to go to prayer. Let me let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to the book of James, chapter five, verse sixteen. James, chapter five, verse sixteen. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Let's go back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans chapter 15, verse 30 says this, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. With all the prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all the perseverance and petition for all the saints. Conflict drives us to prayer. And when we come into this prayerlessness, and many of us, we fall, into the, we fall into that trap of prayerlessness. Then God has to send affliction into our lives. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19 tells us the following. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. And he says, for I know, I know that this, is, this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 25. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, he says, Brethren, pray for us. Why do we have such great difficulty asking for prayer? Are we that arrogant? Are we that prideful? Are we that self-sufficient? I've got this. I've got this. Don't worry about it. God, I got this. You tell the church, I got this. You tell your family and friends, I got this. You tell your, 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 you tell your, your brothers and sisters in Christ, I got this. You've got nothing. Paul's difficulties made him what? Paul's difficulty made him dependent upon the Lord and it drove him to pray and it should drive you to pray. The Arabs have a proverb. Okay? And I remember, and I've worked in a lot of Muslim countries, you know, and they have a proverb, you know, and it says, all sunshine makes a desert. And you go, what? What did you just say? All sunshine makes a desert. 
Look, the danger of prosperity, and here's the point behind this proverb, the danger of prosperity is that it encourages a false independence and security. The danger of prosperity is that it encourages a false independence and security. All sunshine makes a desert. It makes us think that we are able to handle life alone. For every one prayer, listen, for every one prayer that rises to God in days of prosperity, 10,000 rises in the days of adversity. Did you hear that? I remember when I, I remember when I had crossed over from Pakistan into Afghanistan. This is years ago, and, and you know we're at the height of the war that's going on there, and and um, and we went and we we spoke to many believers. Okay, there are many believers in Muslim countries. Okay, they have, they're in the millions. If you don't know that, okay, you just don't hear much about them. And I remember as I sat there with a man who was a hundred and four years old, this Muslim man who had come to Christ, and he said, "All sunshine makes a desert." I looked at him and went, hmm. You know, when people speak to me, speak to me in that manner, that you're saying something. I know you're saying something to me. I, I got no clue what you just said to me, but I know you're speaking to me. And so, and through the translation, I, I said, please explain this concept to me. Okay? And it was so fitting. It was so fitting because I grabbed it, I grasped it, and I understood it. And I said, wow, what profundity and amplitude. Okay, and amplitude was in what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, it makes it says, he, and what he said was that the danger of prosperity is that it encourages a false independence and security. It makes us think that we are well able to handle life alone. For everyone that he says, for every one prayer that rises to God, that rises to God in the days of prosperity, in the days of prosperity, ten thousand prayers rises in the days of adversity. You know, the great ex-president Abraham Lincoln of years ago, of yesteryear, in the history of the United States, he said this, quote, unquote, he says, I have often been driven to my knees in prayer because I had nowhere else to go. Wow. Abraham Lincoln said, I have often been driven to my knees in prayer because I had nowhere else to go. That's exactly where it should drive us. It is, it is often in, it is often in, uh, how would I say, it's often in misfortune. It's often in, mis in, in, in misfortune. It's often in misery. It's often in, in malady. Okay? In, in malady. Okay? It's often in malady that a man finds out who his true friends and his need for God's help in his life. That's what you discover. Okay? That is why the Lord allows bad things to happen to God's people so that they will learn to seek him. You get in a desperate situation and you reach out to your brothers and to your sisters in Christ. You reach out to your deacons and you reach out to your associate pastors and you reach out to the congregation and nobody's responding when you find yourself in a state of misfortune. Mm -hmm. okay? You find yourself in a state of misery. Mm -hmm. And if you find yourself in a, in a state of, of, ma uh, of malady mm -hmm. and, and no one's responding. And that's because God is driving you. You to your knees to seek him and seek him alone. Okay? The Lord likes to hear from us. The Lord wants to hear you. He wants to hear you talk to him. He likes to hear from you. How often? The question is, look, 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 notice the simplicity of this, of this question and yet the profundity. How often do you speak to him? Is it only in times of distress? Is it only in times of discouragement? Is it only in times in despair? Okay. Do you speak to him? But do you speak to him in times of delight? Turn your Bibles to Isaiah. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the prophet Ose, uh, in the prophet in the prophet Isaiah. The pro and Isaiah chapter fifty-five verse six. And Isaiah chapter fifty-five verse six. He says this. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Fool. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You know, some folks, some people, will not pray because they have a problem with apathy that puts them in this, in this, um, um, it puts them in this spiritual slumber, if you will, okay? You know, actions that are sinful, attitudes that are sour, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 they, and they develop this adamant spirit, okay, that is rebellious toward the Lord. You know, the Bible warns us. The Bible warns us of several elements that will hinder our prayer life. Now, so now the question is, what hinders our prayers? What hinders our prayers? Number one, let me tell you exactly what hinders our prayers. Number one, stability, stability that is lacking. Stability that is lacking. People, you know, you know how many people who are not stable? I can't, I can't even tell you how many pastors that I don't. Who are not stable. For the life of me, I can't even figure out how they still have a pulpit. I can't even figure out, you know, how, how the church still ha retains them. There's a lot of unstable preachers. There's a lot of unstable leaders. There's a lot of unstable deacons. There's just a whole lot of unstable Christians. Stability that is lacking will hinder your prayer. Let me show you this. James chapter 1. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. James chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. It says, But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Look what he says in verse 7. For that man, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Do you hear what I just said? This is not my opinion. You know, my opinion, my, my so-called wisdom means absolutely zero. What does God say? Look what he says in verse 7. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. You who are unstable, what are you waiting for? You're waiting for something you're not going to receive. The second major thing that hinders our prayer life is sin in our lives. Whoa, there you go, stating the obvious, right? Sin in our lives. Hear what the hear what the psalmist says. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter sixty six verse eighteen. Psalm chapter sixty six verse eighteen. If I regard wickedness, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard wickedness, you know that's a word that that sounds so antiquated because we don't use that language anymore. We should. We should. You know, we so we have so contemporized and modernized our vocabulary and so forth then that we don't even understand what the Bible says anymore. He says here, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Again, listen to the prophet Isaiah. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Listen to this. He says, But your iniquities but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And I hear people say to me, and I, and, you know, I deal with a lot of pastors. I deal with a lot of pastors around the world. I do, and, you know, through the Talmud, you know, we deal with a lot of pastors, you know. And we deal with over 12, with something, some crazy number. I think it's 12,800, something like that. And, and, and it just it amazes me. When he tell me, God's face is hidden from me, and I go, mm, buddy, son, let, let me talk to you. Let, let's just scratch. Let's go beyond the surface, okay? Let's begin to go underneath, and you begin to find out there's sin in their lives. What else will hinder your prayer life? Number three, selfishness. Selfishness will hinder your prayer life. Look what he says in James chapter 4, verse 3. James chapter 4, verse 3. These are principles that I'm, that I'm trying to, I'm trying to just, just plant in the deepest parts of the recesses of your heart and your mind. Number three is selfishness. In James chapter 4, verse 3, he says, You ask and you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives. You ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Oh, yes, so many of you are caught up on health, wealth, and prosperity. You're a fool. You are an absolute fool. 
You have placed all your security upon health, wealth, and prosperity. You are a fool, because those things will come and go. As water passes through your hands, all those things will pass through your life. So what else will what else will hinder your life, your prayer life? Okay, let me tell you what else. Number four, stubbornness toward God. Stubbornness toward God. Turn your Bibles to the Old Testament, Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter seven, verse thirteen, it says this. Zechariah chapter seven, verse thirteen, he says, "And just as he called, and they would not listen." Are you listening? Listen to me. Pay attention. Just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. You wouldn't listen to me? Why should I bother listening to you? And when do you most call upon the Lord? When you're in deep, deep problems. That's not the time you want God to turn his ears off. But you cause that. Listen to me what he says. And just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen. This is God talking. Proverbs chapter 1. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. Now look at this. And let's just let's just go down here. Let's just go down here. Let me turn over here and uh, let's look on uh, verse six. No, no, no. It's a verse twenty-four. Proverbs chapter one, verse twenty-four. Look what he says, starting in verse twenty-four. And in fact, you know what? Let's work our way down to verse um, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Proverbs chapter one, verse twenty-four to twenty-eight. Look at what he says here. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock. He goes, I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, and, but I will not answer they will seek me diligently but they will not find me do you realize that god also informs us how to get our prayers answered and how to pray properly do you understand that brother just pick up the book man pick up the book pick up the book pick it up I mean, you're so busy reading everybody else's book. Read the book of books. Man. Get into his word. Feed your soul. I'm not against books. I would be a fool to tell you that. I've got a whole library, and I've read every single one of my books. I got my books so marked up that I couldn't borrow I couldn't lend it to you because I got all kinds of notes in there, okay? But you better spend more time in this book in this one just get the pure word of god just get the pure word of god i'm not listening to anybody else's commentary or what they got to say to me you know you know what get the book and hear the word of god get the book god also informs us how to get our prayers answered and how to pray properly so now so now we come to the next question what are the conditions for successful praying? Now, I'm not trying to give you some formula, you know, some cute formula, 1.1.2.3 1. 1. like this, you know, you know, and here's a formula for success. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to get you to. I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw your attention to principles, principles that you have to live by because way too many of us live by circumstances. So what are the conditions for successful praying? Number one, contrition contrition. Look at the Bible. Open your Bible. to an old, let's go to an old familiar passage. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Now, we're going to take this verse, Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, and we're going to draw the principles out of verse 14, okay? We understand that we have to take the, we're taking the verse out of its context, but what we're doing is we're looking to seek to draw the principles out of it. 
In Second Corinthians, in Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse fourteen, he says this: "And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land." 